last talk of this morning session for today, was presented by Irina Kamansky, who will talk about silicon and silica. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll try to be short, not delay, to delay you too much from the exciting excursions. Uh, so the, just the subject of this presentation doesn't require a long introduction, since everybody knows that there were a lot of attempts to make silicon produce light and to find the ways to increase its efficiency. One of the most efficient ways to control the size and the density of silicon nanoparticles in different media was acknowledged to be super lattice approach. And this is exactly the type of samples we are going to talk about. Which one? This one. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so the samples were grown as alternating layers of non stoichiometric uh, silicon oxide or silicon dioxide. Uh, the typical thickness was in the range from one to five nanometers. Uh, the number of such pairs uh, was from 10 to 40 pairs and Afterwards, so the technique was plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition. The samples were grown in Freiburg University, Germany, by one of our colleagues from end courses of this presentations, presentation from Moscow University. So after annealing at the temperatures above 1,100 centigrade, uh, in the layer, which is formed by non stoichiometric oxide uh, nanoparticles of silicon are created, surrounded by, in case of oxide system, by uh, silicon dioxide. Uh, this time, we increased the number of matrices uh, for getting such structures in addition to uh, sil silica. Uh, this time, the layers were um, silicon nitroxide or nitride. What is the advantage? Uh, nitride obviously has a lower band cap, thus we have a higher conductivity in the resultant, resultant structure. So um, we, as a result, we get quite an efficient luminescence for our systems uh, exhibiting uh, uh, quantum confinement effect uh, with the shift uh, of the center of the luminescence bands toward higher energy with decreasing nanoparticle size. Uh, this uh, image, TEM image, just proves that indeed uh, we get what we are discussing, alternating layers with silicon nanoparticles inside. And this time I want to report quite new results, uh, which were not properly analyzed just yet, uh, but they're good about them that they are quite fresh. So we used X-ray reflect uh, reflectometry to check the layer structure of our samples. If you see, the figures uh, have three type of oscillation frequencies and the, this one uh, corresponds to the whole uh, thickness of the total number of layers. Uh, this one to the pairs of layers. So even after annealing, some layer structure is preserved in some of the samples, not in all of them. We had an additional peak uh, which said about some structures of um, 10 nanometer size, which appeared to be a caping of the uh, samples, so the chemists uh, uh, protected the super lattice by a CO2 layer. And after that, I believed it completely. After we saw what we didn't know exist, <laughs> it became very persuasive for me. So we also made an attempt to 
get to proof that silicon really creates nanocrystals, not just nanoclusters. For that, at ESRF, uh, the beam line, BM25B, Spanish beam line, we uh, made a grazing incidence X-ray diffraction experiment. So I would not say that uh, the curves look fantastic, but believe us, we were struggling for that. This was just thin layers of little particles. So now we know, I think we know now how to improve and we plan this autumn to repeat the experiment. So it would be premature to apply sure approach to try to derive the size of nanoparticles from the data of this type. How it proves that not only in oxide case, but also in oxynitride and in nitrides, we deal really with the nanocrystals. Uh, another technique uh, which we did apply was uh, photoelectron spectroscopy, or more strictly speaking, electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis. Here uh, you can see survey spectra for all three types of samples exhibiting core levels of oxygen, nitrogen, and uh, silicon. Uh, and indeed, since uh, all the samples were covered with 10 nanometer layer of silicon dioxide, uh, if you do not do anything to your samples, you see just the silicon dioxides, since they escape the length of the electrons with the energy about 1 keV is about 10 nanometers. To look really inside our structures, we have to remove this layer somehow, and for that purpose, argon etching that is, bombardment of the surface by argon ions uh, was uh, applied. The experiment was done in Kurchatov Institute. The setup is pretty new. So everybody was to get experience with the regimes, with the modes, currents, and so focusing should be. Thus, uh, nitride spectra were extremely helpful for that. This is the evolution of of the spectra got from silicon 2p core level, which we obtained. So black curve is what we see from non-treated sample. Uh, then after three minutes uh, uh, of etching, we get it broadened and we see some bump. This is not binding, it's just kinetic energy. I will later on see uh, same spectra in binding energy terms. But finally, uh, after some half hour bombardment, you get the spectra that stop moving. And everyone knows that uh, if you try to study an insulator with photoelectron spectroscopy, you have to do with the surface charging. And indeed, at first, uh, we saw all the spectra shifted uh, towards uh, lower bonding energies. But in fact, with the argon bombardment, we see them uh, moving towards higher kinetic energy. That means lower uh, binding energy. But there is really no contradiction with anything. This is, uh, the cause for that is that we get rid of the insulating layer. No charging of the surface occurs. And we really observe. Uh, this is what we see from untreated sample. So we do see the peak with the bonding energy about 104. So it's still with the effect of charging uh, corresponding to C4+. Uh, this C4 plus uh, is from CO2 uh, composition, ionic bonding between the atoms, and a little bump at some uh, lower binding energies. As soon as we get rid of the surface layer, we get a more complicated peak, which in this figure is deconvoluted into three uh, components, one of which is still C4+, and the lower energy one is C0, which corresponds to covalent bonding in silicon nanoclusters. Uh, the second intermediate peak is a combined effect of non-stoichiometric oxides, 
uh, with the, the valency one, two, three uh, of silicon, which we didn't go into de details. So really it proves. Even now, you can come across publications uh, that people believe that it's not really silicon which is luminescent in uh, nano-sized silicon, but some defects uh, or oxygen or hydrogen-related defects. And by this, we just prove that really there is a contribution for all these non-stoichiometric defects but this has certainly to be studied in some more details. Uh, we studied all this business with the, all these soapy lattices using a technique which is much more familiar for us than um, X-ray diffraction or photoelectron spectroscopy. It was luminescent spectroscopy. And what we did see is the increase of the photoluminescence yield in uh, this was an oxide structure, silicon nanocrystals in silicon dioxide, an increase of the quantum yield up to six electron volts. Uh, to understand the origin of that, we asked Christophe Dujardin to measure uh, the absorption, which he did. This curve belongs to him, uh, which proved us that we do not see photon multiplication here, though we could have if we just uh, use the same rationing as we do for bulk materials. Here, we deal with photon energy is exceeding uh, the energy band gap more than twice. That is why we could have got uh, an electron uh, with the kinetic energy exceeding the energy band gap. Somehow, comparison of the excitation and absorption proves that it's not the case that really absorption uh, in this case is quite a bit different than in case of bulk silicon, which is shown by this dashed curve below. Why is that? Let's try to see it. So we applied quite a um, simplified approach dealing with just density of states and uh, assuming of, that we have three weight percent of silicon in silica in silicon dioxide, we can plot such density of states. So here, are, here is the valence base uh, band of silicon. This is its conduction band, forbidden energy band gap. And these are density of states of the surrounding matrix that is silicon dioxide. Uh, plotted in a different way, it is displayed like that where we can see, and this is uh, roughly done for two nanometer silicon nanoparticles. We have an enlarged band gap. Uh, these are the states of silicon, and these are the states of silicon dioxide or uh, non -local, unlocalized states. So on the left, we have uh, this same thing, but in uh, sort of densities of states. These states represent transitions within silicon nanoparticles. So that is uh, a hole and electron inside the particle uh, with starting above four electron volts. Uh, are there processes starting when uh, uh, the uh, hole is still in the nanoparticle but the electron is already in dioxide? Uh, here, hole in dioxide uh, electron. Okay, I'm speeding up. Uh, thus, uh, since we uh, looked in extended range, we could um, uh, try to investigate the processes of creating multiple uh, excitations. And the key difference between bulk uh, samples and nanoparticles ones is when you create two pairs, like that, if kinetic energy is big enough, you end up with two excitations, but at a distance of interaction, meaning that they can immediately, via Auger process, come back, the situation can be reversed. So I have no time to discuss the mess of all the states which were analyzed dealing with uh, two electrons, two holes, and electron and hole states. Uh, 
we also have to take into account cooling down uh, we, with the interac by the interaction with phonons to get the correct uh, threshold value. Somehow this explains why the yield grows up to six and then drops. And further measurements were done on other uh, in on silicon nano crystals in other matrices, which confirmed the previous results. And I think an important conclusion, this is just summarizing experimental ways, that to control uh, the efficiency of such uh, superlative structures, one ha can control conduction band and valence band offset. Co-shell particles can use to shift the ratio between Auge and Fanon cooling. And using matrices with long thermalization lengths can also be really meaningful. That's it. Let's thank the speaker. Uh, so now we are open for discussion. Any questions, please? Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, did you or are you also going to uh, look at the time resolved spectroscopy for this? Yes, these? yes. Yes, this is what we are preparing for. Yeah, I think this must be very informative. More questions? Not yet, though. More questions? Well, in any case, I, in this case, I have a small question. Uh, how do you relate your material with this enormous amount of results on porous silicon? Is it really different? Well, there are some overlapping features and there are some differences. It can be put into just one sentence. Yes, yeah, certainly it is. Everything was started with porous silicon, I think. Okay, thank you. So let's thank the speaker again and Christophe will deliver some information.